Good, good afternoon, everyone, and it's Education Week. Welcome to a special episode of Spanning the Need. This week, we are talking a variety of different spectrums from high schools opening up for during the pandemic, as well as colleges and universities. Today's episode, we're going to talk about it with a college president, how the college is handling the pandemic, and what plans they have moving forward in the fall semester. With me today is President Dr. Wes Fugate of Wilson College in Pennsylvania. Dr. Fugate, it's pleasure to pleasure to have you on my podcast. Delighted to be with you and uh, uh, wishing everyone out there uh, that, that, that those that they care about most and themselves are well during these challenging times. Yeah, I mean, it, you haven't been president very long. No, in fact, I uh, today would actually be the um, uh, the, the end of the seventh month of my time being physically on the Wilson campus. I started a few days earlier than that remotely, but um, uh, I have I have been at this for a very short period of time. Yeah, and how does it feel to go from president as soon as you come in, and next thing you know, you're dealing with a pandemic, which you probably would have never thought of taking over pre the presidency at Wilson. Yeah, it was actually uh, a year ago tomorrow that I would have submitted my materials to indicate my interest in becoming the president of Wilson. And when I look back at that letter of interest, um, you know, the issues that you see there just uh, some some have risen in importance um, since the pandemic and others have just completely fallen away. Um, it, it has been interesting because I had all of these grand plans. Um, I have, I'm a, a guy who has studied uh, the college presidency since I was an undergraduate and had an interest in becoming a college president. So I have been thinking about what my first few months as a president would look like and everything started out really wonderfully. And then, um, you know, things changed so dramatically and all of those plans kind of went out the window and we had to start to focus on how to react to uh, the pandemic and how that impacts our students and our faculty and staff. And we'll get into that a little bit later, and we'll talk a little bit about how Wilson College is handling the pandemic. Talk about how you got started and, and what your goals were when you started and where you are now. Well, um, as far as getting started at Wilson, um, you know, my first few weeks uh, were really dedicated to getting to know the institution and getting to know people. Um, I think of myself as a relationship oriented kind of guy. Um, I think, you know, you're only as strong as your team and you need to know your team uh, to know, um, you know, how to support them and, and help them succeed. And so I spent the first few months um, uh, getting out and meeting folks on campus, meeting students, um, listening to their Wilson stories and hearing about their needs and their dreams for the institution. Um, I also try to do that, of course, with our trustees um, and with our uh, alumni and alumni. We used to be a woman's college, uh, so I, I still refer to the graduates during the uh, single sex era as uh, alumni um, and those from the co-ed era as alumni. But, um, uh, you know, that really proved to be um, uh, a smart tactic because uh, I am leaning on those relationships that I was able to build in the two months that I was uh, able to meet with people in person um, so that, you know, now in a, in a virtual world, um, I'm not just talking to a screen most of the time. I actually have had an opportunity to meet uh, some of those great people. Um, they know me and they know what I'm um, interested in, in in doing, what I'm passionate about, and how I hopefully can help Wilson succeed and, and make it through this pandemic to the other side to make sure that we continue to serve our students very well. And how did you get there? You know, you have a very extensive background and tell a little bit the viewers about what your background was before you got to Wilson College and how you kind of got to that stage. Sure. So um, I am a, a part of the American dream. I am a first generation college student, the son of a, a coal miner and a beautician and had the great opportunity to go to a, a small liberal arts college, Center College in Kentucky. Um, studied drama and economics, so truly a liberal arts graduate right there. Um, and um, knew um, after meeting the college president there uh, and, and having conversation with him that um, I should try to pursue uh, a college presidency as a career. And he really guided me on what he thought the modern um, president uh, needed to know, uh, what experiences they needed to have. 
And I should say, he just retired on July 1. So he was a college president for 22 years. So I think um, uh, he knew what he was talking about. And so he recommended to me that I get experience in a broad number of areas, but eventually um, becoming a chief of staff to a president. And so that's how I set myself out. I began doing fundraising for Kentucky's Governor Scholars Program. I did alumni relations and, and, and um, an annual fund eventually solicited the first gifts for our um, capital campaign. It was an endowment campaign, actually, uh, for, for that program. For a brief period of time, I worked on a presidential campaign. So all of those rallies that you would normally be seeing right now if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, I helped organize those for a presidential candidate at one point. Um, and then I went, um, uh, by the way, all, while that was all going on, I was doing my master's degree on the weekends. Um, <laughs> that's, and that's a lot because I'm going through it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I told myself I would never do that again, work full time and, and do the master's degree on the weekends. But I did my master's at Vanderbilt. Um, so I was in Kentucky most of the time driving every weekend uh, to take courses at Vanderbilt. And um, my degree there was in higher education administration with an emphasis in institutional advancement. And I, I was one class shy of also having a double emphasis in student um, affairs and student development. Um, I left there to um, go to the University of Georgia, uh, where I put that student development uh, uh, part to work. Uh, and so I was working in um, Greek life, fraternity and sorority affairs, overseeing the um, 27 uh, interfraternity council uh, groups there while I worked on my PhD at the Institute of Higher Education, uh, University of Georgia. Uh, as I completed my coursework there, I knew I wanted to try to get back to a liberal arts setting and uh, was really uh, uh, delighted to um, eventually uh, go to Randolph College in, in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, and that is a small liberal arts college uh, that uh, really was a great place for me to build my career. I started off as an executive assistant to the president, grew to be um, um, the chief of staff and vice president where I oversaw communications and marketing and eventually became the vice president for student affairs and dean of students. There was one other stop in my journey that I didn't share with you and that's after the campaign period and, and before I went to Georgia I was also the deputy chief of staff to the governor of, of Kentucky um, and worked on higher education policy, um, oversaw the first lady's office for a period of time and um, I also did um, uh, um, the scheduling and advance work that you uh, see for the governor. So that was a great experience, but it taught me very quickly that I needed to get back on a college campus because I really missed the energy of being in an intellectual community and working with students. And, and that seems to be the, the background that you give is that you love the students. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you, I, I think you shouldn't be in one of these roles if you're not committed 100% to student success. And so um, our students, uh, when they were here, got to see me uh, attending their concerts and their games and their um, uh, meetings. Uh, um, you know, anything that I could be at to support them, I wanted to do it. And, you know, I still continue to do town halls with them, meet with student government regularly. Um, anything that I can uh, to continue to hear from students, hear about what their wants and needs are, and let them know that their president supports them. Well, and, and people may watch this and say, hey, uh, hey, uh, I'd love to be the president. It's only an eight to five job, which it's really not an eight to five job. Oh, I wish it were eight to five. So I, I usually get up at 5 a.m. Um, I'm I try to begin my morning every day uh, reading um, and writing uh, until uh, nine o'clock, nine o'clock or when the meetings begin. And then um, I, I try to take a break at uh, five o'clock to have dinner and spend time uh, with my husband. Um, and then I go right back to it. And I usually do that till about nine or 10 o'clock at night um, and then try to get some sleep and rinse and repeat. It's been a, a especially grueling during these challenging times. Um, I, I can only imagine what your what goes through your mind with all this going on. I mean, uh, talk a little bit about Wilson College and, and talk about where it is and, and what, what kind of atmosphere has been going on there lately. Sure. So, you know, Wilson is a remarkable place. It has weathered storm after storm. And, and, and uh, ironically, our uh, uh, mascot is the Phoenix. And so we always say we like to rise from the ashes. And, and actually, the city that we're in was burned during the Civil War. And so we literally did rise from the ashes. Um, uh, and, uh, 
you know, this, this is a, a resilient place. Um, we uh, find ways to, to, to get through challenges. And so several years ago, enrollment had dropped uh, to a pretty alarming level. And uh, our trustees made a very courageous decision to move from being single sex to um, uh, co-educational. Uh, we added some new majors and really uh, some graduate programs, and the enrollment has really taken off. And so um, while most institutions in the country have been losing enrollment, uh, Wilson has actually grown um, over the last decade, and that's been a remarkable story. Um, a lot of that is certainly due to the people here. So you can imagine that an institution that has been going through the growing pains, if you will, um, uh, uh, it, it was ready for uh, some challenge to come along. When the, when the pandemic hit, we were actually very fortunate. Uh, we were a week later in spring break than most institutions. And so uh, we had a little extra time to make preparation. Um, and uh, we were fairly accustomed to online learning. We have a number of programs that offer online learning. Uh, we have a great instructional technologist that helps us uh, prepare our faculty for that work. So we gave them a few extra days and, and, and quickly pivoted. That was day 77 of my presidency to announce um, that we were going to be going entirely remote for the rest of the semester. Um, and our student uh, development team, fantastic, reaching out, supporting students from afar. Uh, you know, all of our tutoring went online. Uh, you know, we were having, we have a personal librarian system. Um, and so each student's kind of assigned a personal librarian to work with them during their time here. Those folks were working remotely to keep students engaged. Um, was it perfect? Absolutely not. We know that that was kind of emergency remote instruction, but I think uh, we pulled it off as well as one might hope to do. Um, we had to do a virtual conferral of degrees in hopes that we might have an in-person uh, commencement ceremony uh, in October. It looks like that will now, uh, not be able to happen. Um, but you know, we, we took the spring in stride. Um, it certainly, of course, was a significant revenue loss for us, as it was for many, many colleges and universities across the country. Uh, we immediately started to put in some cost-saving measures to help us weather uh, those challenges. Um, but uh, fortunately, I you know I have to, to commend our federal government. They certainly came in to help us. Uh, we were able to get some CARES Act funding. We had a PPP loan, um, and so. Uh, those dollars really helped us uh, quite a bit. Is it everything to make up for the losses that we're experiencing? No. Could our students have used um, a lot more financial aid or uh, help to get them uh, through it? We, we serve a, a, a large number of low uh, uh, income and middle income students. And so, uh, no, they needed uh, so many more dollars than we could provide. And in your in over the last five to ten years, your enrollment's gone up almost fifty percent. Is that is that an accurate number? Yeah, it is, and uh, you know that that uh, has created challenge for challenges for us as an institution because of course we have to grow uh, with uh, it with, with all of that. And um, you know we were, we were maxed out that uh, we could put a few more bodies in some uh, residence halls, but um, uh, n not very many. Um, so uh, you know we. Uh, we figured out creative ways to make it work and um, it has developed into a wonderful community. And, and that's the funny part is like, it's a good problem. It's like yeah. good trouble, good problem. Yeah. Until you're thinking about trying to isolate students or, or, or uh, quarantine them. You know, I, I think of some of the other institutions that I know of that have had uh, due to the um, enrollment declines, they have an extra residence hall that they can set aside for isolation of quarantine space. And we just don't have that luxury. Um, so uh, that that uh, is proven challenging for us as we were making plans for the fall um, as, as so many other institutions have experienced as well. Well, and so let's talk about how Wilson College has been handling the pandemic. What key points can you say that Wilson College has done to really handle the pandemic? You mentioned a little bit about um, going online and, and some other factors. What were some big key things that you probably were hesitant to do because of the unknowns? Well, you know, first and foremost, health and safety was always the priority. Um, uh, when it came to our community, our, our students, our faculty, our staff, and frankly, their families and the local Chambersburg community, I always tried to keep uh, the health and safety at the forefront of my mind. And then secondly, thinking about delivering the best 
a quality education that we can and ensuring that we have a strong student experience. And then thirdly, worrying about um, the financial ramifications of those decisions. Um, so, you know, I think as, as we talked about, the spring went fairly well, but immediately uh, in, in early May, we started to put together a series of task forces to identify what would we need to do to be able to resume in-person instruction whenever the government allowed us to do so. Our summer term uh, was primarily uh, remote instruction. Um, most of our courses in the summer tend to be online anyway, so that was very familiar for us. But we did in July um, allow three of our um, veterinary nursing um, uh, students, uh, three courses of our veterinary nursing program to come back. Uh, to do in-person lab experiences. We have a pretty renowned uh, veterinary nursing program and um, we have a new facility that we just opened last fall, uh, but they need to be in the labs working with the animals. Uh, one of the courses is uh, surgery. You know, it's hard to do surgery if you aren't actually there doing it with the animals. And so we brought them back. It was almost a pilot course to see how things might go for the fall. But we have those three task forces, one focused on instruction, one focused on student support, and one focused on life safety. And we came up with a very extensive plan about how we might um, support uh, students through this, uh, through this challenge, through um, uh, tutoring, um, uh, mental health services, those sort of things, um, how we could support our faculty to make sure that they were ready to pivot no matter what happened in the fall, whether we were in person, online, uh, if they were um, in person, but some students had to be isolated or quarantined, how would we deliver instruction to those? Uh, it was weeks and weeks and weeks of work. And we announced in early June our intention to return to in-person instruction in the fall. Um, it looked like everything was headed in a good direction at that point. Um, and then by the end of July, things started to change. And um, on July 31, I made the very difficult decision um, on the, the last day of the seventh month of my presidency to move to um, online instruction for the fall. So we'll have about 45 students on our campus um, and uh, uh, they are students who have no other place to go to um, or might not be able to learn well from home because they don't have the internet uh, services there. Uh, they uh, might be in a setting where they're sharing a room with multiple siblings and they can't find the privacy to study. Um, all of those students we're still going to accommodate, but everyone else will learn from home uh, remotely. Um, and then it's still our strong desire to be back in person for instruction um, in January. But just today, I released our comprehensive plan online um, for how uh, campus will operate. So, you know, we'll be in masks all the time. Um, as many of us that can remotely work will continue to remotely work. Um, we have uh, hand sanitizing stations everywhere. We'll be doing the dining hall where you will pre-place an order and then you'll come pick up your meal and take it out. Um, and, and I know that food's very good because I got the COVID-15 myself for meeting there um, in the spring. Um, so a lot of elaborate plans put in place to help protect our students, our faculty and staff, and also our animals. Because we are such an animal-friendly campus, we have horses, dogs, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, you name it. Um, we have plans in place about how we're going to be able to support the animals through this as well. Well, and, and let's talk about that. A, a lot of people think, and, and maybe it's just me that I've worked on a college campus before, so I know it goes into the task force, the groups coming together to prepare that master plan to either bring kids to campus or do online. What, what can you tell us about how that process went through and what were some of the decisions and talks behind the scenes that maybe people don't understand what you're, what you're talking about, what you're going through and, and who your, uh, your stakeholders would be. Yeah. So, um, you know, first off, a lot of this was about educating ourselves about what we knew about the virus and what we didn't. And so I, um, have been in you know, more webinars, uh, than one can count. Um, I do two calls every week with all of the 90 something private college presidents in Pennsylvania. So we can be briefed by our um, association on all the information and best practices that they have. We're in regular conversation with our commissioner of higher education, who's also the deputy secretary of education, um, so that we can hear what the uh, state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is recommending. Um, we've had uh, even briefings from the CDC. Um, we've consulted with local health officials. 
um, everything that we can to inform us about the best science at the time that we're trying to build a plan and make a decision, understanding that as this virus becomes um, 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 more well known, we're learning more about it and things are changing. And so I keep telling folks, these are the plans for now and things, things may change. Um, we had to go through a lot of um, uh, exploration about testing and how, frankly, you know, our nation isn't where we need to be in regards to testing. And that's part of the reason why I decided to move online. Um, we saw uh, in our pilot program that there was difficult difficulty accessing testing, particularly for those who are asymptomatic. And, uh, you know, being in a residential college setting, if one student uh, uh, who lives in a residence hall were to test positive, the CDC recommends that everyone who shares a bathroom with that person would need to be isolated and tested. Um, and, and asymptomatic testing is, is, is difficult to come by right now. And even if you are able to get it, the, the test results sometimes take 10 to 14 days. And so- and, and I think people don't understand that there's just more to it than just testing. There's contract testing, there's contract sourcing, just to just for one incident, at least on a college campus, especially K to 12. That's right. Uh, you know, contact tracing, we had identified six different individuals who had gotten certified through the John Hopkins course. Um, and, uh, you know, they are already in place and working on our campus as, as that becomes necessary. Uh, but it's a lot of work. You know, those other six people have other jobs at the institution. Um, but now, you know, if they are in the process, anytime someone becomes positive of, of trying to get in contact with anyone that they've spent more than 15 minutes um, in, in, a, in a space, you know, um, uh, uh, six feet or less apart. And so that becomes very laborious, but it's what we need to do to protect the health and safety of our community. Yeah. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that we want to get at is safety, safety of our students, our staff, and anyone else that visitors included. I mean, you don't want to have a, I know there was an announcement made about, I'd say about two weeks ago that all sporting events have been postponed for fall. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, the um, uh, Colonial States Athletic Conference of which we are a member, the presidents are the board of directors. And, you know, that's very tough for us as, as division three institutions, our students aren't um, getting compensated uh, to play. Uh, they don't receive scholarships. Um, they do it for the love of the game, and um, it's a significant part of their collegiate experience. And um, I am the furthest thing from an athlete, but I love going to the games and supporting our students. There, there's video of me out there leading cheers with our students. Um, it's a big part of the experience as a Wilson student uh, to be able to uh, either participate as an athlete or, or go to those experiences. But it became very clear that this was going to be very challenging to do in a safe way. And particularly as the NCAA issued their recommendations, um, you know, you have to keep health and safety as a top priority as much as it breaks my heart that those students are going to be able to get those experiences. Um, when we when it came down to health and safety, it was an easy decision uh, to make, although a heartbreaking decision to make. Yeah, I know that depending on what college D1, D2, D3 Sometimes there's a lot of money tied up with the football program or or bigger money making programs that support the rest of the athletic department. Yeah, the Division One institutions have a lot more difficult uh, uh, choices mm -hmm. to make when it comes to the dollars around this um, because they're making money. Um, uh, in in Division Three athletics, there's uh, you know very little money that's made. Occasionally, some folks will charge for a football contest or, or, or uh, maybe basketball. Um, but for the vast majority of our institutions, and certainly at Wilson, there's no fee to attend our contests. We want as many people to come and cheer our athletes on as, as, as we can. And so um, in that sense, we're, athletics is always losing money. Um, you know, athletics is there because we think it enhances the student experience. We think it, it, it helps them develop leadership skills. Um, and, and will help them when they leave our hallowed walls to, uh, to go out and, and have a meaningful career. Uh, but we don't do it for the revenue. Uh, we're not getting big sponsorships. Um, Especially D3s. Different. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so um, from our standpoint, the, the financial decision around uh, canceling athletics is really about will we lose students because a lot of students really want that experience and they might choose to stop out um, uh, or go to a different institution if they can't play. Now, you know, the vast majority of division three institutions have said, 
um, we're not going to have athletics this fall. And so maybe we won't lose many students to that. Um, but that certainly um, is, is probably in a number of folks' minds as they're making these decisions. For me, I had to put the health and safety first um, and, and worry about the uh, financial ramifications of that later. And I think you're in the you're in a vast majority of safety of our student athletes, safety of just students in general. And athletics does build a leadership. It does build management, and a lot of other things, which is a good thing. And I'm glad that presidents are taking that stand to say, hey, I understand about fall sports. I understand that you want to participate. It's like, I love sports, but your safety is more important than the sport right now. That's right. Um, I, you know, I think um, there's been a lot in the media about colleges and universities making decisions for the right and wrong reasons. And, you know, every institution has its own dynamic. Um, you know, I was just in conversation uh, several weeks ago with uh, an institution president in Pennsylvania, um, and one of which we actually compete for students who is moving ahead with being in person, but they have a very different um, circumstance. You know, 98% of their students live on campus. So once they get through those first two weeks, if, if students aren't really going on and off a great deal, um, maybe they have a better chance of, of uh, containing it. For us, we have a, um, a large number of students who commute. And so uh, the possibility of, of the virus coming in and out is, is significantly high. So I don't, um, uh, I don't envy any of my presidential colleagues as they try to make these decisions. Everybody needs to come to a decision that's good for their institution and uh, their particular circumstance about where, uh, what the virus positivity rate is, what the infections per 100,000 um, are in their region, in their area, um, how they might have space to quarantine or isolate, their access to testing, uh, the, the, the ability to get test results back quickly. Every institution's in a different circumstance. So now you've made classes for the fall online. That's right. Where do you go from here planning for the future for Wilson College? Well, certainly right now we are very focused on making sure that we deliver the absolute best online instruction that we can. Uh, we have had to modify some, some courses. We know that some courses that we wanted to deliver have to be done in person that can't be done this fall. So we're moving those to another semester. Uh, some of our uh, hands-on courses will be done in an intensive in December um, uh, for particularly veterinary nursing. The lab components will be done in an intensive. Um, so we're working through all of those plans. We've also acknowledged that many of our families are uh, struggling right now, um, particularly as I mentioned, you know, we serve a, a high number of of uh, low and, and, and low middle income students. And so we decided to offer a January term course for free to every student um, uh, to help them through this challenge. Um, well, we don't normally have that many students taking uh, our January courses. So we've got to now decide what courses are we going to offer? Are we going to offer them in person? Or are we going to offer them online? So there's a lot of preparatory work that's going into that. Fortunately, those three task forces that we talked about earlier, they've made extensive plans for the moment when we actually feel like it's safe that we can bring students back physically to our campus. So I don't think we'll have to do a ton more work. I think hopefully um, testing will be different by uh, by December and by January. And we'll, you know, I, I hope that we're in the, the period of time where we actually have very effective um, uh, quick turnaround tests, whether that be, you know, an hour or 15 minutes or 15 seconds. I hope that that's where we'll be. Um, you know, I don't want to get my hopes up yet about a vaccine, but hopefully in time a vaccine will come or even treatments. Uh, you know, uh, there are certainly um, some uh, some various uh, viruses that we've become accustomed to, the flu, for example, where some people get vaccinated, uh, some people don't. But we have treatments to help people get through it um, when they do get it. And so I, I hope that we as a country and as a world, we'll be in a better place by then. And I just want to continue to encourage our federal officials um, in particular, as well as our um, state officials. We need to put all that we can into making sure we get the testing and the tracing work done. Um, that will be what I think can help uh, Wilson College reopen and reopen safely. Well, and I think that's a, that's a great point is if you had students on campus, and we talked a little bit about it, but if one comes up with it, just tests positive. I mean, 
the tracing and the money that just goes into finding out where they were, locking them down, locking down the students, locking down faculty and staff that may have come in contact with that person. Because as a close knit college or a university, you can go from here to the to the the lunch area, and there's a hundred students there. Next thing you know, it's a where were you? Well, I was in the cafeteria on Tuesday. Well, there was another hundred people there. That's right. I mean, let me give you an example. Um, the New York Times uh, developed a uh, a model where you can go to their this particular article and you can plug in what county you're in, how many students might be in. This was designed for K through 12, so a school. Close um, enough. And and we'll all use use that for us for now. Um, and it could tell you based on the positivity rate in your county um, and the number of students, um, faculty, and staff. Um, what, how many people would arrive on day one with the case? And for Wilson, if, if, you know, obviously not all of our students come from Franklin County where we're located, but let's use that as a proxy. If that had come true, we'd have started day one with four people who were infected. If those four students had all been residential students, um, living on different floors, the moment they became positive, we would have had to isolate all of the students who had been sharing a bathroom with, with that student. Let's not even talk about class or the dining hall, just the people who shared a bathroom with them. Um, that could be somewhere between 60 and 80 students. Uh, we had identified uh, you know, about 18 isolation spaces. Um, and, and I should clarify the difference between quarantine and isolation. So quarantine um, is for positive cases and people who are positive can live and share space with another person who's positive. But somebody that we don't know yet if they're positive, but we know that they've been exposed, they have to be completely isolated. One room, one bathroom. And that's all that's the only place they can go. So we had hoped, you know, that we might be able to use a hotel for that. Um, well, you can imagine what the cost for this could be if we're going to have to have 60 to 80 people um, being in a hotel. And because the testing is taking so long to turn around, it would be 10 to 14 days. Um, that's not a great experience for the student to be, be in the hotel. Um, it's not a great experience for us to have to you know, uh, deliver food to them, supplies and provisions to them. Um, so this started to become untenable. Uh, a, as an option, it just it, it seemed like when would it stop? Um, you know, it was really something that could get completely out of control, and it became very clear at that point uh, that the right decision to do for the health and safety of all would be to go online. And I think the the point of this is that you're responsible for all that. The that's university right. is the one that's held accountable to pay for those hotel rooms, do the servicing, do the testing, doing all that, which could cost probably $5,000 a person, depending for 14 days, hotel rooms, tracing just for one or two people. That's right. And, you know, um, right now, private higher education um, isn't really receiving su support for that. Um, so, you know, whereas, uh, you know, your local school district uh, is, is having tax dollars to help support that work, um, uh, your public institution institutions are receiving tax dollars to help support their work. Uh, private institutions, um, besides uh, the little bit of money we got from the CARES Act, which doesn't even begin to cover uh, the expenses, we're, we're paying for that out of our pocket. And, and I think sometimes people forget that's different from businesses. You know, if, if a business, um, if somebody, you know, tests positive uh, and they need, well, if, even if they think that they have symptoms, they can go to a local hospital to get the test. Um, but we have to do that differently because we've got students in residence living with us. And so um, it, it is very complicated for, for higher education institutions and, and a very expensive proposition. And I think that's what I wanted to get out to the viewers is what really happens behind the scenes. People hear about it, but it's like you're going through this if this happens. If B happens, you're going to have to pay. And this is what you do. This is your protocol. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in some cases, some institutions that have low residential populations, they may end up spending uh, less um, uh, and e e even with losing all of the room and board revenue, 
they may end up spending less because they won't have to spend all of those dollars on the on the precautions. Now, unfortunately or fortunately for us, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, we've already spent a great uh, amount of money with all of the preparations. So in the planning to go um, on online, we'd already you know put up plexiglass in a lot of places. We'd already gone through and added all the hand sanitizing stations. We had you know separated um, um, uh, chairs in classrooms. Uh, a lot of work had already gone into place, and I suspect that the that we won't be uh, in a place in January where those precautions will have to go away, and so uh, we'll still probably benefit from that. But even with us being online, we've already spent a lot of money to help protect students. And of course, for the 45 students who will still be on campus and for our faculty and staff that will be working on campus, we still have to have those precautions. Well, and I think that's a, that's a great point is like just because you're Wilson College doesn't mean that any D1, other D2 schools or D3 schools are going through the exact same thing. Every university and college is, is going through the exact same thing. That's right. And, you know, in some ways, um, I think federal and, 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 and state officials wanted to give institutions flexibility. Um, and I appreciate the ability to have some flexibility. There were also some times, however, where I wish that we had more direct guidance, um, particularly around testing. Um, and tracing. It would have been very helpful if we would have had some uniform way of providing the testing and tracing. I think that would have helped uh, higher education and our K-12 schools um, move to in-person instruction more quickly. And that's good to have background information on kind of what you have done already and, and what students, if students come back, let me ask you this question. If say, let's say September, October, we're kind of flattening the curve, everything's kind of maybe getting back to normal, Will you bring students back or is fall semester, no matter what happens, no matter if we go good or bad, will it be all online? You know, we explored that scenario. Um, but what we ended up deciding is that the up and down, the we're online, we're going to go in person and then maybe the virus surges again and we're going to go down again. And then we'd already made the decision to end early at Thanksgiving and move to remote instruction after that for our final exams. You know, that up and down, it's uh it's exhausting for students and for faculty. Um, it, it's stressful for them. And, um, and, and I suspect that many institutions may have to do that. And we just said, you know, for our student experience, we think it would be better to just start online and stay that way. So it's ultimately a scenario that we said isn't going to work for us. And we're just going to commit to being online for the entire semester with hopes of, of course, bringing some students back in December um, and then more students in January. And then hopefully, our entire student body by spring term, depending on where things are. And that's a good plan to have. It's like, we're, don't matter what the, what it is, flatten curve or just whatever cases that get reported, you have a plan and that's good to hear. And I, and I think you should be commended as, as the president that you guys are prepared. Well, as you can be prepared in this unknown situation that tomorrow that plan could probably go to just crash and say, you know what? We got to start from scratch because all this just happened. I tell our students, um, you already have the great answer to a question for a job interview. When someone says, can you tell me about overcoming an obstacle or can you tell me about how you can be flexible? This experience would be the perfect answer. Exactly. So, Dr. What, Dr. Fugate, I appreciate your time. Are you up for a little Q&A with some people that have posted some questions? Sure. Delighted to do it. Here we go. First question, I'm going to pop it up on the screen. Okay. This question is from Greg. Will Wilson College, I think we answered this, will Wilson be able to have on-campus classes at all or all online? I It'll think he's probably I think he's probably talking in general down yeah. the road. We will be all online until um, some in-person experiences in December. Okay. And then you'll regroup and kind of figure out where you are um, for January. Does that kind of make sense? That's right. That's right. I think, um, you know, as we as we think forward, uh, there are some uh, of our majors that have to have an in-person experience for accreditation purposes. And so um, if we if we have some online experiences in in the spring, I suspect that some of our majors will have to be in person. And that's understandable because you can't do surgery as a veterinarian at home. That's right. So but I mean, you seem like you have a great plan on your hands with, with social distancing and the plexiglass and a lot. So I commend you for doing that and getting those students 
if it's very few, it's almost like a test run. It is, yeah. And we can hopefully do that safely. And I think we can. It's just as long as we can do it the right way. But like we said, there's too many unknowns. That's right. Uh, the next question, it looks like it comes from Renee. The student safety is important, but what about the education? Some students don't learn good online, but are great in the class. How do you judge that on the students? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, um, it, it's certainly the case that um, folks learn in different learning styles. And I, I remind folks all the time, you know, there are different learning styles within in-person experiences. So some are lecture focused, some are experiential focused, some are discussion focused. Um, so there are different learning styles um, throughout uh, higher education. Um, but even if um, you don't love learning online, you need to be able to learn online because that is the movement of the future. Um, uh, of course, there are going to be experiences where people are going to be learning in person. But uh, if you think about all of the professional development that I've done over the last several months, it's all been online. Um, if you um, even think about pre-pandemic, so much learning takes place online. In fact, you know, the current generation, um, they learn more from YouTube um, than they do uh, from uh, their uh, uh, in, in high school experiences, uh, according to them. Um, yeah. um, and so um, I think this is a very important skill. Uh, the business world, uh, we do most of our uh, 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 work, well, all of our work basically right now online, but a lot of that work in the future is going to be online. You're hearing about companies that are saying, you know, we're, we're going to abolish offices and we're going to allow people to work from their homes. So this experience is going to help prepare students uh, to enter the world. Now, of course, I want them to be back in person at some point so that we can have them learn the other experiences that they need. But this is a great experience uh, to help prepare, prepare students for the real world. And um, I think that we'll be able to do that online education very well. Fortunately for us at Wilson, we've got a number of support mechanisms to help students um, if they um, are struggling um, with, with learning online. And, you know, I'm one of those that I would much rather sit down with a, uh, a group of people in a classroom and, and, and learn from each other that way. Um, but uh, uh, I know that there are supports here at Wilson for students if they're struggling. I mean, you're looking at eight months almost or close to eight months of either lockdown, stay at home orders. And now the household word is Zoom. Yeah, that's it's going to be a I guarantee you the Webster Dictionary is going to come out with a, a new definition of Zoom, not Zoom into your camera or Zoom into your phone. It's going to come back, have a complete definition. I'm going to call it. <laughs> well, you know, it's also important to remember that um, as you as you think about Zoom, some people automatically think that the online education that institutions are going to right now is going to be all done via Zoom. And I would say, don't think that way. Um, yes, in the spring, a lot of courses moved to Zoom instruction because we were trying to replicate a in-person experience. But that's called synchronous education. Um, you know, you meet every Monday at 9 a.m. and have a conversation, right? But a lot of online le learning is asynchronous. And that really can be beneficial for students and their families. Um, you can learn at the pace that is good for you. If you want to, you know, watch the, the video lectures um, uh, at 2 a.m. Uh, on a Tuesday night, you can choose to do that. Um, and so I think there are a lot of benefits to uh, that type of online learning. It's much more convenient for students. And so at, at Wilson, we'll have a variety of synchronous uh, online courses as well as asynchronous. And that, that's that's great information, and it's great that we're able to provide that. And I'm glad that you guys are doing a, a heck of a job trying to. I mean, the job ain't easy. If, <laughs> I mean, just coming into this, no matter who you are, what president you are, what even associate or any type of college or K to twelve. I had superintendents on um, on Tuesday from two schools in Ohio, and they were telling me the same thing, like changes like they're going to hybrid if they want to keep kids off and, and go from there it just there's so many unknowns moving forward and their plan I, I remember talking to one superintendent he goes yeah our plan was good for one day and then the next day something changing we we had to basically throw that book out and start from scratch yep i know so, that all too well <laughs> yeah 
Dr. Fugate, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for taking your time. You can stay on here. You're always welcome on my podcast. And, and thank you for everyone joining us tonight. And this is basically, you end our first season of Spanning the Neat. So I appreciate uh, you taking the time and, and everything like that. Well, uh, very much enjoy getting to share some of uh, the unique experiences I've had. And to all of the folks out there, if you know a student that's still looking, um, you know, I know a lot of people put off making plans, but if you feel safe being at home, uh, we uh, start our classes on August 24th, and we still would be delighted to have you be a part of the Wilson family. So uh, just let us know. We'd be happy to work with you. Great. That's great to hear that. And just for the record, they've increased 50% in the last five to 10 years. So that more more trending than a lot of other schools. Yeah. So we'll be back in September with more podcasts and interviews. Check out other podcasts and interviews at anthonyvspano.com. Mm-hmm.